Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, we introduce you to a group of people who face checkpoints, blockades, curfews and other restrictions just to make music. And wait until the end of our show to find out about a popular art installation that lets you walk under rainfall without getting wet. But first, we check out a gorgeous building in Italy. Losing yourself behind the magnificent facade, we talk to an author who wrote the remarkable story of Palazzo Ricciolai from a completely different angle. Representation matters. We'll talk about the rise in young adult fiction written by Middle Eastern authors. And the winners of the coveted Aga Khan Award for Architecture are announced. Palazzo Ricciolai, one of the most beautiful buildings in Florence, dating back to the 15th century. A lot has been written about its splendid architecture, but now a new book tells its striking story from behind its celebrated facade, slipping between the cracks of history and telling us all the drama it has witnessed over the years. Now, to find out more, let's turn to Alison Levy, the writer of House of Secrets, The Many Lives of a Florentine Palazzo. Hi, Alison. So, Tell us what brought you to Florence in the first place and to this particular building, because as far as I know, it's quite off limits to the public, isn't it? Yes. Uh, well, I was teaching uh, at the time here in the United States, uh, teaching Italian Renaissance art history, and I had a sabbatical leave, uh, a year off from teaching to do research for a new book project, which was uh, intended to be a book on Italian Renaissance tomb sculpture. So quite a heavy, serious topic. And uh, I really badly needed a break from the routine of teaching after many, many years. And so I was looking forward to, of course, a year in Florence, but also uh, hoping to live in a, in a very wonderful location, but uh, never imagining that I would find a room in Palazzo Rucciolai in this iconic 15th century Renaissance Palazzo. Uh, so it was it was quite a surprise when I discovered that apartment. And then, of course, I moved into the house uh, and, and made a whole set of discoveries. And it really shaped my year. But why were you convinced that it would be a better idea to write this book instead of the other one? Well, I was um, part of my surprise was discovering this whole other history of the house. Of course, as a professor of Renaissance art history, I knew the house uh, as, again, an iconic monument um, of Renaissance architecture uh, as a 15th century object. And so when I moved into the house, I discovered these layers of history uh, over 600 years. This Ruchelai family has owned this house without interruption. Uh, they, have, they have possessed this home. They gradually had to open up spaces uh, to non-family members, and I was one of them at a certain point. Uh, and moving through this historic space in the uh, early 21st century was some, somewhat surreal, and uh, that was really the impetus for writing the book. I didn't want to write a traditional architectural history because so much has been written about the facade of the house, uh, the architect of the 15th century and the great patron of the house, Giovanni Rucciolai, but no one had really thought about the house um, and its inhabitants beyond the Renaissance. And to me, that was a story that was fascinating and needed to be told. Now, what was the most interesting story you found out about? Well, uh, there are so many, um, and of course the book is structured um, by century, and so there are characters that I, I feel are representative of events that unfolded in this house, lives that have played out there, um, people who have, um, who have died in the house as well. Uh, one of the most interesting stories that came very much as a surprise was the discovery of a dissection in the family garden which happened in the 16th century. Uh, so there, there are a lot of wonderful uh, parties and, and, and other celebrations that took place, of course, in this house over uh, half a millennia, but there are also some darker secrets. 
uh, and stories that um, are quite remarkable. So there was a, a monster, as it was described, uh, that had been found in the neighborhood, and it was dissected, uh, of course, in the middle of the night uh, in this garden. Today, we would refer to the monster as uh, conjoined uh, twins. Um, but this was uh, a time uh, of great discovery in the 16th century and investigation, and yet there there still was this um, this element of um, sort of gore and uh, and surprise. And there is also the uh, story of the art dealer who was murdered in the house as recently as 1997, actually. Well, that's, uh, again, a very unfortunate turn of events that, that played out in 1997, exactly 10 years before I moved into the house for my sabbatical residency. And, and this took me completely by surprise. So this wasn't a story that I had to unearth in the archives in Florence, but this was something that, um, that had happened just a decade earlier. I heard about it actually uh, through the neighborhood, uh, people still talking about it, people very uncomfortable with this story in, in large part because it is still unsolved. Uh, and so I went to the National Library and read newspaper accounts about it. And, uh, you know, as an art historian, having come to this house thinking that I know so much about the history of this house and this family, to then sort of be hit with this uh, really unexpected story of a murder uh, that was, uh, I think, probably the impetus for writing this book, um, to, to have that moment of realization for myself uh, that so much has happened here in this house that we don't know about. Uh, so that was um, uh, an event that happened on the third floor in the house, and I was living in a much smaller apartment also on that same third floor. Uh, so there was also... Uh, a strange feeling uh, of, of sharing a space uh, with the art dealer who had been murdered there. And the uh, remaining members of the Richelieu family, uh, I mean the grandchildren of the uh, 15th century patron and architect of the house, Giovanni Richelieu, do you know if they've seen the book? I don't know if they have. The book was published in the UK uh, and released in the rest of Europe at the end of January of this year. And I uh, had a wonderful trip to London and where my publisher is and then to Florence. And I presented the book there. Uh, the Italian newspaper uh, La Corriere della Sera has also uh, run a, a story on the book. So it, it is available uh, in Florence. Alison, uh, your own experiences are also part of the book. There is a personal narrative running as well. So I wonder how it was like uh, living with these ghosts for you in the same house. Well, it was, as I mentioned earlier, quite surreal. Uh, there is a personal narrative that runs through the book uh, because I think that Obviously, it's a story of discovery. As an art historian, I am I am unearthing these layers of, of, of history. But there's also a story of self-discovery, uh, of moving in and, and coming to terms with the fact that I knew so little about this monument, as, as would be the case for most of us, because it is still a private home. Uh, and so... Um, this personal narrative plays out over the course of my sabbatical, uh, and there's, a, I think, a, quite a compelling narrative arc, uh, a story that's told about um, how much I discover about the house, but as well about myself and my relationship to history uh, and to art history in particular. I, I think it probably goes without saying that I never wrote that book on tomb sculpture. I was immediately distracted when I moved into this house, uh, and I ended up spending that sabbatical uh, digging around, um, trying to find out all of these secrets of Palazzo Rucellai. And so by the end of the sabbatical, I suppose you could say I did have a, a, a new book project, uh, and I just continued writing from that moment. Well, sounds like a really lovely project. Um, Alison Levy, thank you so much for sharing the details of your book, um, House of Secrets, The Many Lives of a Florentine Palazzo, today with us. Thank you very much.
still to come on Showcase. Off to Palestine. We'll hit the road with the Palestine Youth Orchestra, a group of musicians challenging everyday oppression in their lands. Enjoying the beauty of rain without getting soaked. We check out an installation which makes this possible. And now for a quick look at some of the stories from the world of the arts and culture, starting with a painting which was hidden from the public since it was created more than 150 years ago. This rare painting by the Pre-Raphaelite painter Dante Gabriel Rossetti goes on public display at the British Museum. The painting is part of a collection recently donated to the museum by the late art historian and collector John Christian. What makes the medieval-inspired painting, titled The Death of Bruce Sans Pitié, exceptional is that it's very unlike Rossetti, who's best known for his dreamy aesthetic. The winners of the 2019 Aga Khan Award for Architecture have been announced. This year, six projects from around the world have been awarded, including an education project in Bangladesh, the Palestinian Museum in Palestine, and a public space development program from Tatarstan. Established in 1977, the awards celebrate the projects that cater particularly to the cultural needs of the Muslim communities. The winners will share the $1 million prize between them. One of the proofs of Banksy's Girl with Balloon goes on display before being sold by Christie's later this month. The print will be shown in London's South Bank, where it was sprayed on a wall 17 years ago. Banksy produced 88 artists' proofs with different color variants for the Girl with Balloon. And this is the first time that any of the color variants are being offered at auction. We'll have to wait and see if this copy of the Girl with Balloon will do anything to itself right after the sale. Darth Vader's mask and helmet from the Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back is going under the hammer. The prop is one of only a handful worn by actor David Pras, who played Luke Skywalker's nemesis, and it's expected to fetch about $500,000. The piece will be sold among a vast collection of Hollywood treasures at the Icons and Legends of Hollywood auction, which will take place on September the 25th and 26th in Los Angeles. Young adult fiction has been a popular genre since the 1990s, thanks to the unprecedented success of Harry Potter books. Then came other book series like Twilight and Hunger Games, all with teen protagonists in various different genres. However, for the longest time, if at all, popular young adult fiction books didn't have much minority character representation until now. A rising interest in reading about teens from the Middle East, North Africa and elsewhere manifest in new publications by Middle Eastern authors. Social problems like Islamophobia and racism may be common themes, different to the issues facing their white peers. But first and foremost, they speak a common language, simply as teens from around the world. Now, to tell us more about young adult literature drawing inspiration from the Middle East and North Africa, book reviewer Ilham Essali joins me. She recently penned an article about this particular genre in the Middle East. Hi. Hi, Ilham. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate your time. So I want to talk about the Middle East uh, conflict, how right, it informs you. the contemporary young adult fiction from the region. Is there a direct influence? Yes, so of course, um, these conflicts are an integral part of uh, people's everyday lives. And that's, of course, what people, what, what writers will write about. They write about what people actually go through. And in this case, it would be the youth. And um, like in any other um, like YA, YA books, um, the, the like predominant themes will be themes of, they'll be coming of age stories and themes um, of um, sexuality, growing up, um, love, identity, except that in this case, you'll find this overshadowing presence of um, 
sometimes um, war um, or um, occupation, sometimes some sort of, um, of crisis. Um, yeah, and um, I think in many cases, um, the writers will, will kind of um, use uh, their own experiences and their own trauma, to, you know, their own experiences to kind of um, process their traumas. And, in, and it would be a sort of, um, sort of a writing cure for themselves and for the, the readers as well. And sometimes it's not that direct and in your face. If I, if I may, I mean, fantasy, I feel like yeah. is used a lot as well, yeah. maybe as, as a form of escape. Would you agree yeah. on that? Yeah, um, well, I think um, like in most cases when fantasy is used, it would be, um, well, in, in, in fantasy stories where you'll see kings and queens and conquests and empires, it's most of the time it'll be some sort of, um, of critique of um, like some sort of political critique. And uh, in this case, uh, I don't think she, well, in, in some books, uh, they won't um, like pinpoint um, directly at like, like a, a country or like a regime, but you'll find kind of more of a sub subversive and more hidden kind of critique uh, in, a, in form of fantasy. And I think uh, it's probably used as well to avoid uh, any kind of persecution or any kind of trouble for the writers. So a lot of the examples in the piece that you penned for the Middle East Eye are by diaspora writers and the characters are from diaspora as well and uh, their issues are usually identity issues in the western world so i wonder if the yeah. readership is from yeah. the diaspora as well for these books yeah well i think for these kinds of for, for books written by diaspora writers i think the main audiences well i think there's two main audiences uh, the first one would be the actual children of, of uh, children of the diasporas who will um, finally read these books and finally find this um, representation in the books. And the second um, the audience, I think, would be people who don't have a Middle Eastern or North African background and who can, uh, you know, finally find an unbiased or inside sort of um, uh, view into um, what goes on in, uh, and, you know, to get to know the, these cultures. Um, but also, um, I think... Um, the reader there's obviously the books will also be read by people of the middle east and of north africa but um and they can to some extent they would be able to identify uh, to the characters and to the stories and to the books but i think uh since you know uh, they won't have the same issues of identity uh, islamophobia maybe racism then i think those books were mostly written for a western audience whether um, 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 a western audience of a middle eastern background or not Mm, you just said that the, the uh, readers could finally find unbiased fiction. So I wonder how it was like before the emergence yeah. of this genre. I mean, when, uh, when teens from yeah. the Middle East couldn't well, find characters in fiction that, that, who didn't eat, act or uh, talk yeah. like they did. What kind of a message did it send to them, you think? Well, um, I think most of most readers, well, most of us uh, didn't um, grow up reading books that had characters that, uh, you know, um, spoke like spoke like us or talked like us or, um, or eat or have the same religion. Uh, and um, I think it does have an impact um, on your identity because um, it kind of sends the message that your story and your your whole existence is sort of not does not matter as much. And uh, it's very important to finally have these stories now, and there's this huge emergence of new stories by, by people of, written by people of color, and uh, the publishing industry is definitely changing a lot. But before that, um, I think if you were an avid reader, it was very hard to not find yourself in those books. Mm. And um, so, what's your favorite book from uh, young adult literature drawing inspiration from the Middle East and North Africa? Well, um, I would say my favorite one would be one called um, Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga. She's a Jordanian-American writer, and she wrote this book. Uh, it's actually one written in, um, in poetry form, well, in, in free verse form, and it's about a young, a young girl called Jude, and uh, she's a Syrian um, refugee who flees her country when the civil war starts. To, to, she flees to America with her pregnant mother, and they go and live there, and uh, it's a whole um, readjustment for her because there's... Um, this whole new country and she has to deal with this whole new identity whilst having to think about back home and her family and the war and uh, it's um, it's an amazing book because it gives um, a beautiful representation um, for um, young girls who um, might be from a similar background or might or have might have uh, gone through something similar as her because there's not that many uh, refugee stories out there but it's also an extremely positive representation of um, 
of Islam and of um, hijab. And I think that's very beneficial for um, young girls. Well, Ilham Es Salih, it was great talking to you. Very important topic indeed, um, yeah. uh, people of color in literature representation. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us today. When you think about a group of musicians preparing for a concert, you'd assume they rehearse together. What you probably wouldn't imagine is them having to pass military checkpoints together with their fellow band or orchestra members. As draconian as it sounds, that's exactly what a Palestinian musical act has to go through each time they come together. They recently wrapped up a European tour in spite of the many logistical challenges that faced them. Ever since it was formed in 2004, the Palestine Youth Orchestra has performed in many countries. But its almost 80 members, which include Muslims, Christians and Druze, reside in different cities. One of them is Lamar Ilyas, who lives in Bethlehem in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. This orchestra is unlike any other orchestra in the world. Each time we have to meet in a different city or country, not just in Palestine, because unfortunately we can't all meet in Palestine, not in the West Bank and not even Jerusalem. That's because ever since Israel occupied the Gaza Strip, West Bank and East Jerusalem in 1967, the country's military enforces checkpoints, blockades, curfews and other restrictions in these territories. Other members of the orchestra live in the Druze majority, Mughar town in Israel's northern district. Definitely playing in the Palestine Youth Orchestra uh, made us aware of the situation much more. And uh, once you play with your friends in Palestine, you can never imagine yourself holding a rifle instead of your <laughs> instrument and standing on the checkpoint, preventing them to play. Uh, in the concert in Jerusalem because your boss said you cannot let them through. The young musicians explained how they also have to deal with prejudice and stereotypes. It's always a shock to everybody that, wow, these play people can play music. I personally um, don't like the amount of shock that people have, like, oh, you can play classical music. And now off they go to show off their skills and kick off their three-week Europe tour. The last 24 hours it's been quite difficult logistically because we have to get people from all around Palestine. Um, people have to pass checkpoints, have to go through do different borders to get there. So hopefully we'll all, we'll all get there in one piece. After performing in Norway, Denmark and Germany, the orchestra wrapped up their tour in Amsterdam at the Palatial Concertabau, the home venue of their conductor in Santa Cort. Their program was a combination of traditional classical and Arabic music. Our message is that today we have uh, an orchestra and uh, tomorrow we will have a country. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But one last story before we go. Paying $30 to experience rain might sound ridiculous, but not if it's the magical rain that doesn't get you wet. The groundbreaking installation by the artist group Random International is visiting the Southern Hemisphere for the first time, and visitors are eager to plunge right in. I'm Ilfere Ketli, thanks for watching, bye for now.